First product, CockroachDB, a database which is scalable, survivable, and consistent that may not make much sense to every one of you, but let me quickly run you through what we're actually doing. So we have a company called Cockroach Labs. It's very new, um, funded a couple of months ago, um, just cashed in the first round of funding, Series A with um, participation Benchmark, Google Ventures, Sequoia, and Firstmark. We are very engineering heavy. Um, currently, everyone on the team is an engineer, nine of us, but um, that's going to change in the next weeks, I suppose. We'll have non-engineers and probably more engineers as well, because what we're building is a very technology-centric product. Um, as far as the background goes, it's um, very, very Google-centric, but also has a lot of experience from Square, Dropbox, and a bunch of prior startups. And at Google, um, people on the team worked on you know, very, very infrastructure, data, um, data, products that deal with data at Google and a lot of it, such as Bigtable, GFS, Colossus, and Gmail. I'm assuming everyone knows the last of these at the very least. And what we do with this company is really build a database that we would want to use in any of our future endeavors. Um, and just a quick warning, it's in red, it's alpha right now, so it's not a production ready thing, so keep that in mind for anything that follows. Um, just want to point it out. Okay, so what would be the database that we actually want to use for our next product? Well, really, at the end of the day, it comes down to that, the fact that we want to build apps. We want to build apps, not workarounds. We don't want to have to tack on a bunch of things on our database system because it doesn't satisfy our needs. And to illustrate a little bit in more concrete terms what that means, let me just contrast that to things you might be running, your, running as a database these days. So one thing that's kind of maybe kind of from the past, um, but still around a lot are traditional RDBMS systems. So if you're not a database guy, don't worry, but this is basically that thing that 10, 15 years ago everyone had. It was great when you're running on a single machine. Um, the problem is that in the last 10, 15 years, we've all gotten way more data than we are comfortably, comfortably fitting on one machine, and that led to a lot of workarounds trying to make those things which were never intended to run as a distributed system scale out. So, um, if you're a little familiar with this, you might know sharding. Um, that means that you're splitting up your database, your data across different servers, and then your applications have to know which part of the servers are where. Um, also, if you want to have something like a, a failover, so if one of your main servers goes, goes down, you still want your application to work, that also means that you're going to have to kind of build yourself the infrastructure that you that does this for you, that makes sure that if the, say, the, the, the main thing goes down, that the other thing comes up and that the application seamlessly switches to the other thing. So it's a lot of work. It's just a lot of work and everyone on the team has struggled with this at some point in the past. We definitely do not want to repeat that. Um, RDBMSs have one good property though. The access to the data is usually very convenient and very powerful. So you can run something which is called transaction in which you can manipulate everything in your database um, consistently without ever going through inconsistent states, which some of your clients may see and may not want to see. So this is for RDBMSs. If instead you're already one step ahead, then you're using a NoSQL-based system. Um, that is basically the answer to not wanting to deal with all the problems that I talked about in the last slide. Those systems are designed to scale out very, very easily. So if you have more data than you had before and you just add new machines, it will spread automatically, everything's fine. They're also very good at surviving disasters. The problem is, um, and that's a disaster in itself, that in most of those designs, they th simply throw this ease of access of working with the actual data out the window. So in easy terms, that means removing consistent um, operations on your data for the most part, removing transactions, which means that things that were possible on a single node with a, say, MySQL or something like that are now much more and more difficult. And that means that your applications will have to fill in this void. They have to make, do all sorts of weird tricks to get the, the operations working sort of like they want. That's very error prone. And at the end of the day, it's equivalent to your software application developers writing database code, which they shouldn't have to be doing and which causes enormous amounts of pain can actually put the integrity of your data at stake. So what are we actually doing in CockroachDB? Like clearly we're not doing any of the two things I just criticized. So we want to hit the sweet spot between those two paradigms. We want to give you something that grows to any scale as you need it, start on a single node, end up with hundreds, that's fine. Also want to make sure that if something goes wrong, if a data center cuts out, if network traffic fails, if a single node dies, all things which will happen to you if you're running at the appropriate scale, we want to make sure that that doesn't bother you at all. And the third thing, and that's the, I would say the most important thing, is that we do not just do away with this, 
power that you have over manipulating your data. One of the central pillars of CockroachDB is actually having tr strong consistency and having a powerful notion of transactions, which allows you to run your OLTP workloads exactly the way you want them to. You'll never have, again, in your client application have to run this operation that just manipulates a set of data in a weird way because you just cannot do that thing which the application developer wanted to do. And that would be a, an ideal point to start an hour-long tech talk, but um, I can't, so I have to leave it at this high level, but if you're interested in this at all, just, you know, we're here, we're actually in, in this office space, so you know where to find us, we can't run away. Um, and we also have a lot of resources online that explain in depth, like, to any depth really that you need, how this all works. But for now, um, since it's a demo, let me actually try a demo. And um, yeah, so the shell displays correctly, so the most intense part of the demo has actually succeeded. So we're, <laughs> we have a, we're writing a database, so I should be starting a database cluster for you. And really bad at typing, especially in presentations. So I have a script that basically just executes commands I would otherwise have typed, and that is this script here. So, something happened. I'm gonna to explain to you what happens, don't worry. Okay, so three interesting things. So I wanna start a new cluster, which means I have to bootstrap it. I have to initialize it as a one-time action. I just run one command, give it a storage location, done. It tells me that was successful, and as some cluster has been initialized, great. Next thing I do is I create certificates. So we're very aware of the fact that in this day and age, no one should be running without SSL anymore. And we're very aware that a lot of people just still don't because it's usually very cumbersome to work with. So we put a lot of effort into actually wanting to, you wanting to use SSL, making it really easy for you. So that's what's happening here. Just creating a bunch of certificates. And that is already the setup phase, so now I'm ready to start my cluster and I'm gonna do that. And the invocation is also very easy. There's not much data needed. So I'm now officially running one node, even though you may not have noticed a difference at all, but we're gonna look at it shortly. So all, all I passed it was really a storage location and basically a port to listen on. That's pr pretty much it. There's no hidden config file that I edited for hours and hours last night. There's nothing like that. Okay, so now we have a node, and the second you have a, a database cluster, you would presumably run something, something again it, against it. Let me see which of my, yeah, this right here. And we internally have a little example, it's called the bank example. It's very creative because it simulates a bank. Uh, so I'm just, it's a really dumb example, but it, it just puts some load on the cluster. So it has 200 accounts, has money in all of these accounts, and now four guys will run back and forth and just transfer money between those accounts. And that will happen inside of transactions. If you didn't have transactions and multiple people were, would work, be working the cash registers of the same account multiple times, your bank at the end of the day would not have the same amount of money. So it's a pretty good test of running simple transactions. And it's not very exciting to look at, it initializes accounts and now it will basically just execute random transactions. Okay, so let's look at the front end. Let me see if I can close this guy here. So I have one database node running, but we haven't actually seen it. And I'm just gonna show you, give you a brief look at the front end, which this being an alpha version is completely unpolished and will grow tremendously over the next weeks. <laughs> But for now, we'll just, oh shit, no one sees this. Let me see. Uh, presentations in 2015 are still pretty hard. Okay, so now you can actually see that we have one node, which is shown here. There's some amount of data, some stats. They're not super interesting because our cluster is not really doing much. But one thing that I want to point out is that um, it says here we have one under-replicated range. And I just want to, so the range is basically the data that is in our cluster. And under-replicated means that this, this piece of data is only, exists only once in the system. But it, Cockroach by default wants to have three copies of your data. The idea being that if you lose a node that had some of the data, then there's still enough copies left to just keep working. So it's unhappy because it cannot possibly copy anything to other nodes because we are only running one. So a simple thing to do, we'll just add two of them. You'll see the, the example here is just running on. We started two more nodes. The invocation is exactly the same. And now we'll check back on the web UI. And if we are very lucky, then this one should turn to a zero very shortly. Come on, do it. Okay. Ah, mm. oh, there it is. Okay, I didn't, I didn't just run a command that changed this, by the way. Okay, so what happened in the background um, is that two new nodes were started. Two, two new nodes were started and um, 
they announced that they're present on the cluster. The first node, which had this data, which wanted to have new copies, saw that they were there and basically just copied it over. Um, and now we have three copies of our data running, um, being updated um, as the bank example runs. The bank example itself has been blissfully unaware of this. And so we've just basically scaled our cluster. That's how easy it is. You just start a couple new nodes, everything else, your data will just move to the right spots, all fine. And now to make this, let's make this demo a little more interesting by just shooting the one of those nodes dead in the head. We just killed it. Um, it's hard to see, but if you know how to read this output right here, uh, then you will see that there's only two of them running. There used to be three. So we've just killed, completely killed one of the nodes, and the bank example has not noticed it at all. So we've just simulated a data center outage, and nothing really happened. happened. We're still running transactions against our cluster. So now just for fun, let's actually kill the second node. That will be bad because you have three nodes in total. You need two to make progress. We just killed it. And so I guess this is proof that this is a real demo and not just something I taped before. Process has actually stopped and now I'm gonna restart one of the nodes and then if we get really lucky, then this thing should pick up speed. Okay, um, because I'm running out of time, let me actually just wrap up the demo before I see this. Okay, just uh, here, bank example is running again cluster came back to life. So, wrap up. I know this was an intense, fast demo with a lot of shell action, but that's how we roll. Nine engineers, we'll get there. Um, so, but, but points I want to make. So the deployment's a breeze. I mean, surely it's going to be a little more complicated if you deploy to a cloud provider and not on your local machine, but essentially it's the same. All the added complexity comes from the fact that you need to distribute your certificates. The cloud provider needs to have certain things set up, like security groups and whatnot. But even today, you can deploy the system on GCE, Google Compute Engine, or AWS with two very simple lines because we wrote tools for that. And we've seen the self-organizing aspect. Um, we've seen that data just basically moves to new nodes as they come online. The same will happen if one node has too much data. It will just move it over to another node which has less data. So it's very self-organizing. You basically just sit to get, get to sit and watch and, and enjoy that everything works as planned. And then the third thing that I want to mention, because it's very important and often not true, is that the design is completely symmetric. So each of the nodes you start is exactly the same. There's no such thing as a master or a primary or a secondary or like whatever else is out there. It's all the same. Okay? That was my quick demo. Um, if you're interested at all, check out cockroachlabs.com. If you're interested in more technical stuff, check out our GitHub repo. CockroachDB is completely open source, so you can engage with us, contribute code, I mean, delete code. No, please don't do that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to talk to anyone. If you're interested in using this technology at all, also come find us. It will be interesting to see what your use cases are. And we hopefully have time for questions, because there's one. Yeah, so use case. Um, I want the data, some of the data to live in, like have a home, uh -huh. and then it will replicate into the cloud as, as possible, or based on usage. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't want, I anticipate many, many batches of data, so you can't get it, you don't want to replicate it all everywhere. You want to kind of, have okay. So, so the way it works in Cockroach, your data is actually logically segmented. So each, say, 64 megabyte package of data um, can kind of move individually. So if you have um, certain configurations for your data, you can actually influence where it goes. So you could have different, different entity groups of data being replicated in different zones, and um, I think that might be addressing your use case. Cool. Um, there's more I can say, but let's just wrap it up if you're happy already. Oh, you and then you. Are you using Paxos? You no, we're actually using Raft. Raft okay. Yeah, we have a multi-Raft implement, uh, implementation together with CoreOS, we're also in-house, um, which has done us very well. Yeah. We give great control of SQL and NoSQL. Uh -huh. But I'm wondering in the NoSQL space, obviously, it's key value, graph database, document database, uh, table database, uh, right. database. So, so how, how are you? Where are you positioning in there? Are you, you said it's easy to query. Does, it, does that mean that we can go back and query this with SQL? Or, or how is your query language simple? And then mm -hmm. where do you fit in in the high level of all the different types of databases that have evolved? Okay, so the, I'm just going to repeat the question. The question was, where do we fit in with basically the whole spectrum of databases out there? Because obviously I oversimplified to a tremendous amount when I did my very extensive presentation of the space. So um, in, in, in terms of high-level distinguishment, we wouldn't consider ourselves as a NoSQL database, and 
we do acknowledge that there's like a, a gazillion different NoSQL databases out there, um, a lot of which serve, um, but, but what, what they pretty much have in common is that, that they don't offer those consistency um, things. And as far as storage is concerned, Cockroach fundamentally is a key value store, a sorted key value store. So that's really what it is. Um, what we're doing now is we're putting a structured data layer on top that lets you talk about tables, columns, uh, eventually joints, and things like those. And then on top of that, um, there, there could be a structured query language, similar to what Cassandra did with CQL. Um, though we, ha we are, not, are not keen on pushing that out as quickly as possible, we want to see what the use cases are of the structured data API and because putting an, an, a, a structure, um, an SQL layer on top is kind of a different problem where you're writing you know, query planners and stuff like that. But it's definitely in, in, the, in the design. All right, room for one more, everyone happy? We're over time, so it's probably... Yeah, okay, but I don't see any, so... Thank you.